Uh, my name is Hugh Lloyd Ellis, and I'm the head of the economics department. And uh, I am uh, delighted to introduce the uh, presenter of the 2017 Macintosh lecture. Um, so first, I just want to uh, say a few words about um, uh, William Archibald Macintosh. Um, he was a major force in building Queen's University into one of Canada's leading institutions of higher learning. Born in 1895, Macintosh entered Queen's in 1912 and left with both a BA and an MA just four years later. He returned in 1920 with a PhD from Harvard, and in 1927, at the tender age of just 32, he, um, he became head of the Department of Political and Economic Sciences. After a seven-year wartime stint in the service of the nation, he returned to Queen's in 1946 to serve as dean of the faculty, um, and then from 1951 to 1961 as principal of the university. Macintosh wrote numerous books and articles, primarily about Canadian economic history, international trade, and economic policy. He was particularly interested in the period of development in which Canada became a nation, and in his book, The, the Economic Background of Dominion Provincial Relations, published in 1940, um, which was the classic work of, on economic history of Canada up until that time. Macintosh had an important influence on economic policy, both in Canada and internationally. He, he had a strong working relationship with the Mackenzie King government during the 1920s and played an important role in expounding the implications of Keynesian analysis for Canadian economic policy. During the crucial Bretton Woods conference in 1944, um, which hopefully my Econ 239 students uh, recognize now, having not known what it was before. Um, he, was, uh, he was a special advisor to the Ministry of Finance, and he helped to create the, international archi sorry, the institutional architecture that governs international trade and finance uh, to this day. In 1967, Macintosh was awarded the very first Innes Guerin Medal by the Royal Society of Canada which was their highest honor for a social scientist. So this year's Macintosh lecture is to, to be presented by Professor John A. List. Professor List is the Kenneth C. Griffin Distinguished Service Professor in Economics at the University of Chicago, and is also chair of the department for his sins, I guess. He graduated in economics from the University of Wisconsin, Stevens Point, and earned his PhD from the University of Wyoming before joining the University of Chicago in 2005, he was a professor at the universities of Central Florida, Arizona, and Maryland. John is a uh, research associate at the MBR and, and served in the White House on the Council of Economic Advisors from 2000 to 2000, 2002 to 2003. He's a member of the American Academy of Arts and, Science, uh, Arts and Sciences, a, fellowship, uh, sorry, a fellow of the Econometric Society, and has received numerous prizes and awards for his research, including the Arrow Prize, the Kenneth Galbraith Award, and this is the, there's a Finnish award which I can't pronounce, which is the Erjo Janssen Lecture Prize. Is that anywhere close? <laughs> <laughs> um, which is actually almost as accurate as the Macintosh Lecture uh, for uh, predicting Nobel Prize winners. Um, and also the Klein Lecture Prize last year. He has received an honorary doctorate from Tilburg University and has twice been named a top 50 innovator in the nonprofit times for his work on charitable giving. John's research, which includes over 200 peer-reviewed journal articles and several published books, focuses on using field experiments to explore economic questions. In particular, by setting up carefully designed experiments with people performing tasks they are used to doing as part of their daily lives, he tests how people ha behave in natural settings and also whether that behavior is consistent with economic theory. His research includes research into why inner city schools fail, why people discriminate, why people give to charity, why firms fail, why women make less uh, money than men in labor markets, and why people generally do what they do. John's recent book, uh, the the Y-Axis, Hidden Motives and the Undiscovered Economics of Everyday Life, co-authored with Uri Gnizzi. I'm not sure if I pronounced that right either. 
um, has become an international bestseller. As the late Nobel Prize winning economist Gary Becker noted, John's list, John List's work in field experiments in, is revolutionary. So it's with great pleasure that I uh, welcome John List as this year's Macintosh lecturer. There's nowhere to go but down after that introduction. I, that, was, um, that was very nice. Thank you very much. And, and thanks, everyone, for having me. I, I really appreciate This is probably my, I don't know, seventh or eighth trip to Canada, and it gets better every time. So I, I really appreciate having a chance to come and give the Macintosh lecture. And, and by the way, as I'm talking today, if you have a question, please raise your hand. I don't, I don't mind questions or interruptions, or if I say something that you think is wrong, I have no problem holding this as a Chicago-style seminar. And just let me know. <laughs> Some of you know what that means. <laughs> um, please let me know, and I'll, I'll try to answer any questions on the fly. If you want to hold till the end, that's fine, too. OK? So thanks a lot. Ray Durentis, 14 years old. Antonio Fenner, 16 years old. Oscar Marquez, 17 years old. I was doing a field experiment on teen violence, and all three of these boys were shot during that field experiment and killed. The fact is, nearly one Chicago public school student is shot every day in the streets of Chicago. It's primarily a male problem. What do you think a problem for the other sex is? What can you guess? What's a, what's a major problem for teen females? Teen pregnancy. A quick summary of teen births in developed countries. What you can see is your country is very, very prominent on this list. Very prominent. What this tells us is that roughly 20 to 25 women per 1,000 give birth in Canada every year. Nothing compared to the US. Not even close. If you want to talk about countries that are close to the US, you can't talk about developed countries. You have to go to countries like the Sudan and Rwanda. In fact, in Chicago, by the time African American and Hispanic teens reach their 19th birthdays, roughly half of them have been pregnant at least once. What links those two issues? We know very little about their causes and less about useful remedies. Now, we can step back and say, why? As social scientists, how do we typically think about those types of problems? Here's how I think we view those problems. Typically, an economist will have an idea. She will race back to her office and write down a model. She'll then download mounds and mounds of data, beat up that data to say something causal about whether the model is right or wrong and what the intervention should look like. That's more or less how we've been doing business for decades and decades in economics. And if you want to think about that a different way, we have a lot of different approaches, which I've placed up here as ways to model naturally occurring data. Difference and difference models, propensity score matching, IV, structural estimation, et cetera. All of these approaches are meant to make different assumptions so we can say something causal within the data. And we know many people who have made careers out of testing whether those assumptions are correct. Orthogonality or exclusion restrictions or conditional independence. These are all valid approaches, but we can't say something causal unless those assumptions are met. Now let's step back and think about what are the challenges 
that policymakers face. And I think they primarily face three challenges. One, let's evaluate the effectiveness of a policy that has already been implemented. All of those approaches are very good at doing that. Very, very good. Years and years, we've been doing a very good job in analyzing, has this particular policy worked to fulfill some labor requirement, for example? The second challenge, these approaches work less well. Projecting the likely effectiveness of a policy in environments that are different from the one in which that policy was implemented. Now you can make assumptions, make structural assumptions about primitives and how we can move the result from A to B, but they're less well equipped to do that. Now the third one I would argue that they, they do a very poor job at, that's forecasting the effects of a new policy never before seen. That's very difficult. Why? Because we have very little, if any, information on whether that policy could possibly work. That's the world in which we're living in when it comes to teen pregnancy and teen violence. Very few policies that have ever shown any promise of working. So what you might ask, what's the alternative? And if you listen to the great intro, you know what I'm going to say. The alternative, of course, is to run field experiments. Use the world as your lab. And don't stand back as a passive observer and let the data come to you. Go out and generate your own data. Go out and put together treatment and control groups to test economic theory, to test economic policy. Now usually at this point people say, well, what is a field experiment? And we will get to that today. But what I want to take on is, who are my subjects? So you all have a feeling for who has given me these data which I use to test economic theory. Okay, so let me ask you a question. How many of you have flown United Airlines in the past few years? Please raise your hand. Okay. How many of you have taken an Uber in the past six months? Please raise your hand. Pretty good, pretty good. Now this is a flyer just to show off a little bit. How many of you have placed an auction bid or know someone who has for cutting softwood on Crown Lands? A few people got it. This should get hopefully the rest of you. Please raise your hand if you've used Google to search and purchase. Please raise your hand if you have. Awesome, awesome. Has anyone not raised their hand at least once? Perfect, perfect. All of you are my experimental rats. All of you have helped me learn about the real world. You haven't known it, but when you've jumped on a United flight, I was probably behind the scenes changing prices. When you've considered taking an Uber, I was probably behind the scenes giving you potentially incentives or varying prices. Same thing with Google. All of you have been part of at least one of my experiments. I can't say Chris Cotton did this at a particular day. I can't do that. That would be kind of creepy. Okay, so I'm, I'm not a, a creeper like that. But what I do know is when I raise the price of an airline ticket on United Airlines by 10%, I know how people like Chris respond. That's the important thing anyway. And I do know how we can think about testing theory by manipulating prices and non-pecuniary features of items to test things that we don't know about. That's exactly what I do. Okay, so today for the rest of the lecture, I wanna talk a little bit about some of those experiments that I've been running out in the real world. Let's, first of all, go back to those two problems and I'll tell you a little bit about what I've done with those two problems. So for teen shootings, the way we started is we said, can we create an economic model 
that can predict which boys are most at risk. And you can, in a, in a regression model with only three independent variables, you can do reasonably well predicting which boys are most at risk. Now that we can identify those boys, we can think about what are the best interventions to use to make these boys' lives safer. And what we find is the typical thing is that an economist will come in and use pecuniary and non-pecuniary incentives. Pecuniary I mean by giving them cash to do an after school program rather than get in a fight, join a sport or whatever. What you find is that none of that stuff works. The only thing that we found that works is if we literally fly a father figure into their lives and live with them from the age of 15 to 19 and walk with them every day to school, pick them up from school and spend the entire evening and weekends with them. That's the only thing we've found that has been able to work. Now for on the other side for teen births, again, very predictable which women are most likely to have a baby. And these are all Chicago data. Okay, so both of these experiments are in Chicago. Now here, a set of field experiments shows us that pecuniary and non-pecuniary incentives actually work. And what they do is they help the female optimally time the birth of the child. And the intuition here is that if young women have optimism, that they will actually have a chance to go to college. They will push off the first birth. Okay, so that is a very economic answer that give me, change the prices of me going to college and I will be more likely to push off teen pregnancy so I can go to college and then have kids after I receive my college degree. And this was through a set of simple field experiments that we would not have known because those have never been policies that have been implemented. They were the third category in that policymaker toolkit. Now we at least have some evidence about what can work with teen births. Okay? So now let's do something called opening my laptop and I want to be more patient through a first set of studies. I'll start with a gender pay gap, which I'm glad that you mentioned. I'm going to tell you what that is and, and learn a little bit about it. And then I want to go to this question about why people discriminate. And I want to think about the economic models of why people discriminate and various predictions and settings. I, I won't talk about this today, but one thing I've been working a lot on is um, why people give to charitable causes. I'll have a slide at the end to talk a little bit about that, but not at length. And then tomorrow, the entire lecture tomorrow will be based on why inner city schools fail. And I'll tell you about a school that I started in Chicago that essentially led to a, pre, a set of pre-K programs that we are now pushing all across the states to get universal pre-K in the US. Okay, so we'll talk a little bit about those education field experiments tomorrow. Okay, so let's first of all ask the question. Let, let's, let's stay in the gender pay gap for a second and say, are men paid more than women in labor markets? This should be a simple question that data can help answer. And here is a set of countries, and again, you can see Canada ranks well, just like the US, in terms of having a big gap. Okay, so what this tells you is that Korea in Korea, the median man earns about 37% more money than the median woman. What this tells us in Canada is that men earn about 22% more than women. In the US, it's about 18%. The OECD average is about 17.5%. Okay, so the fact is is that on average, men earn much more money in labor markets than women. Why do we think that is? What do you think can explain that? Well, what we can do 
is we can go look at mounds and mounds of data and use those approaches and try to figure out whether things like labor market attachment or skills or education can explain those differences. Okay? And, and economists have done this for decades. So he, what I have here is I have from 1979 to early 2000s, this is the actual female male wage ratio. So what this tells you is it started off about 67% and it's gone to about 80%. That means that women on average earn about 80 cents on the dollar that men earn. And this comes from not my paper, but one of my um, colleagues' papers, Derek Neal. So what people have first done is they said, let's adjust for schooling. Let's adjust for part-time work and put in other controls. And what you see is that shifts up. Okay, so that takes care of some of the pay gap, but not all of it. And then people say, well, let's add additional controls like labor market attachment. And what this means is that women are more likely to drop out of the labor force to have children. Sometimes men do, but women drop out of the labor force much more often than men. This adjusts for some of those characteristics, and you still see that we're at about, I don't know if this is working, but we're at about 90%. So women earn about 90 cents on the dollar after you adjust for those other characteristics. So now we're in this world of what can possibly explain the other 10%. And the economics literature has come up with different reasons. One is discrimination. The other one is along the lines of preferences. And this is where I'm going to focus on to start. That women might shy away from competitive settings. That, that's, that's a part of the literature that I want to focus on now. Okay? So you should step back now and say, well, how can we learn about those preferences, whether men and women have different preferences? I argue that one of the best ways is to do a lab experiment. So gather students in a room like this, have them come in, and have them make choices that you observe, and you try to interpret what those choices mean. OK? So now, in the area of gender and competition, here's how these, these experiments work. And these are not my experiments. It's Muriel Niederle, Uri Genizzi, who you mentioned, has work in this area, Eldo Rustichini. They bring in a group of people, and they tell them, you can choose either piece rate or competition. So your job is to solve anagrams. You have five minutes to solve anagrams. If you choose piece rate, every anagram you solve, we will give you 50 cents. If you choose competition, every anagram you solve, we will give you a dollar and 50 cents if you solve more than your anonymous competitor. OK? So the value proposition is I can get 50 cents per anagram. If I choose piece rate, I can get $1.50 if I choose to compete if I solve more than my competitor. And then they simply look at which one do men choose? Which one do women choose? OK? And then they engage in the activity after they choose it. What you find is one stylized result is that women shy away from competition. And here's what I mean by that. Whether it's anagrams, which by the way, women are much better at solving anagrams than men empirically. Okay? But the fact is, is that only about 25% of women choose to compete, whereas 40% of men choose to compete. Shooting basketball free throws, men are empirically better. About 52% choose to compete, only 15% of women. So regardless of whether the woman is better, she still chooses the piece rate rather than the competitive scheme. So that's where the stylized result comes from. Okay. So now, I'm glad that you, you it's almost a perfect setup, your introduction, because you mentioned uh, when I worked at the Council of Economic Advisors. 
And there, we were revising the benefit cost guidelines. And I was arguing that there are these great results on the willingness to accept, willingness to pay disparity. It's also called the endowment effect. It was work that Danny Kahneman and Amos Tversky had done that suggested once you own something, you need a lot more money to give it up than you'll pay to buy it. So a dollar loss is felt more than a comparable dollar gain, called loss aversion. I was arguing that when we do these benefit cost uh, exercises in the US government, we should take account of property rights. Because all of these lab experiments done by Kahneman, Thaler, Kanesh, et cetera, et cetera, Jack Kanesh was at UBC, they suggest that property rights matter. And here's what a White House official said to me. John, even, those result, even though these results appear prevalent, they're suspiciously drawn by methods similar to scientific numerology because of students who are not real people. OK, so that's kind of the first. Whenever you hear people presenting lab experiments, the first pushback that you hear is that, well, these are students. They don't know anything. Uh, they're, they're just going to do nonsense stuff. And look, I do field and lab experiments, so I, I get it. I get that. That's what people say whenever I present a lab experiment. So now, when Glenn Harrison and I were thinking about how to view a field experiment, we said, well, if that's the big problem with lab experiments, that it's a, a non-representative sample pool, it's not that hard to run what we called an artifactual field experiment. Just get a group of experts to come into the lab and have them go through the choices. Lab experiments aren't in any trouble at all. Just do an artifactual field experiment. OK, so let's go through an example of what an artifactual field experiment would look like in this area. OK? So when I first read those papers, I started thinking about nature versus nurture. And some Harvard presidents get in trouble by talking about nature versus nurture. So I won't go, I won't go down that path. But what struck me is, are these sex differences or are they gender differences? That's a very, very hard question to answer. Whether we're all born the same, but then society tells us what to do and then we act that way, that's a really hard question. So we're going to do something is a first step here, and this is what I call a straw man hypothesis, and I'm going to put that up by saying, on average, in every society, men compete more than women. So if you just grant me that that's an interesting straw man hypothesis, we can then start to learn something deeper about the gender pay gap. OK, so here's our first step. What we're going to do is we're going to go to two very different societies. So all of you who have thought about cross-country regressions and you hate them, this is that basically in a nutshell. Because I'm going to go to two very different areas, and I'm going to impose some control, and I'm going to see if people act differently. I'm not going to say a lot about the underlying reasons why they did what they did, but I'll be able to at least test my straw man hypothesis. Okay? So I'm going to go to two very different societies, one patriarchal society, one matrilineal society, and I'm going to do similar types of experiments in an artifactual field experiment. My patriarchal society will be the Maasai tribe. Any, anyone familiar with the Maasai? Anyone ever hear of the Maasai? Very brutal to women, correct? In this particular society, well, I, I think, yes, these are the red-robed Maasai. When, when I ask a Maasai man, what's your wealth? Here's what he'll tell me. 12 head of cattle, three donkey, four sheep, and five wives. And then, whoa, really? And he'll say, yeah, and I'm actually thinking about taking on another wife, but it's going to be seven head of cattle to buy another wife. Women are literally treated like property in this society. Brutal. The one let's say, perk that they have is that every morning 
the husband has to visit them for 15 minutes in the hut for tea. Uh, that's the privilege or the right that these Maasai women have. Very brutal society for women. On as close to the other end of the spectrum as we can go is in India, the Kasi society. Anyone familiar with the Kasis? Okay, so here's very different. As we're taking the cab ride out to the Kasi villages from Shillong, you see the exact same billboard over and over again. And we ask our driver, what does that billboard say? The driver says, well, it's those men again. They're asking for equal rights. <laughs> hmm, not, now it's kind of interesting. <laughs> well, what do you mean equal rights? Well, they want equal inheritance because the inheritance all runs through the youngest female in the Cassie household. You knock on a Cassie door, the man will answer, take you to the woman of the house, and he will go sit in the corner. She will make decisions that what do we plant, what do we take to market, she will actually go to market and buy, sell, and trade. Okay, not matriarchal, but matrilineal, and we found four of these in the world, and this was one of them. Okay, so now the question is, is what task should we do? Because when you go to countries like this and you try to get the, the people to think in an abstract way, nearly impossible. The women, the Maasai women would not pick up a pencil and hold it. So they also could not do that. So we go through task after task after task and what we essentially find is this task. A bucket is placed three meters away and they have 10 chances. We tell them, if you choose the piece rate, every ball you throw in the bucket, you will earn 50 cents. That's about a week's worth of wages. So now we're, we're doing high stakes too. If you choose competition, you will make $1.50 if you throw more balls in the bucket than the person next door. The experiment is identical in nature to what the lab people have done. And then we look at whether people chose piece rate or compete. And again now, to accentuate the differences between these two societies, a Maasai woman says, men treat us like donkeys. A Cassie man says, we are sick of playing the roles of breeding bulls and babysitters. Okay, what do you think happens when we run that simple experiment? What do you think happens in Tanzania amongst the Maasai tribe? What do you think happens between the men and women when we have them play this simple game? We do it for hundreds and hundreds of people. What do you think the, the Maasai men actually decide to do compared to the women? Okay, that, let's start here. These are the Maasai. The men compete at about 50% of the time, the women at about 25%. In the Maasai tribe, their behavior is a lot like what we observe in the States and in North America. Men compete about twice as often as women. That was sort of predictable, right? We're closer to that side than the other. But the next click is going to be the money click, isn't it? Because that's going to hopefully give us at least a conversation starter about our straw man hypothesis. What is going to happen when I click? How many people think the bars are going to be about the same as the blue bars? Please raise your hand that the matri will be a lot like page, quite a few. How many people think the bars will be about equal with each other? How many people think it could actually reverse? Okay. That's exactly what it does. Keep in mind, we're not randomizing people into male, female. We're not randomizing people into culture. But it at least suggests how important socialization is. When we do this with other games, bargaining games, women in the US negotiate and bargain much less than men. Guess what happens in the Cassie world? 
Their women bargain like our men. Their men bargain like our women. They have risk preferences that are just like women to men and men to women again. It's almost amazing that across several games, their men are like our women, their women are like our men. It opens up the avenue that we're all born about the same, and then society tells us where it is appropriate to be on that spectrum. You can think about when I was little, I, I was raised in Wisconsin. And we had these gym classes, physical education classes, where the coach wanted us to go out full effort every day. Some days you're tired. So, so I would go half effort, because I'd be more interested in the math class. Guess what my gym teacher would yell to me? Hey, List, stop playing like a girl, or stop playing like a sissy. Whoa. And guess what he would yell to the young girl who's dominating? Tomboy. That's the society we live in. Their society tells them much different activities are appropriate. Our society tells women and men which activities are appropriate. So now let's talk about some interpretation. This is going to be loose now, right? Very loose. This isn't a well-controlled experiment per se. One interpretation is that the Cassie Society removes social barriers that prevent naturally competitive women from expressing their true personalities. That's one uh, speculative interpretation that's consistent with these data. Another one is that society allows competitive women to earn greater rewards in markets, and then they pass that on to their daughters, both of which increase the competitive genes. Check. Consistent with that, too. It's very different. Um, it's a market-based, kind of a Chicago-style story but very consistent with the data. Now, what we've done is for the last several years, we've gone back and we're taking biological markers and we're trying to figure out why exactly that's happening. And that's basically where we are in this research agenda, trying to figure out, is it more the first, is it more the second, or is there something different that we have not thought about that we need to explore and figure out why exactly the gender roles are essentially reversed in this society. Okay, I'll stop here. Before I go on to discrimination, I'll ask if you have any questions about this, this first artifactual field experiment. Yes, go ahead. Don't men and women have sexual differences? That's Pardon me? The hormonal differences, mm -hmm. that yeah. the so, so these results will hold whether it's with pre-puberty or post-puberty the results will hold. But the reason why we took biological markers is for that very reason. So we're over there taking saliva to take measures of that to see whether those could be important differences. And we're analyzing those data right now on, on the saliva. OK, yes, go ahead. Yeah. Not yeah. You know what? When I first saw those results, I thought, you know what? That's just risk. It has nothing to do with preferences for competition. It's a well-known result in the literature that women are more risk-averse than men. And the competition sets up a reward scheme that just has higher variance. What we do in these is we end up measuring their risk posture and then net that out of these results. Now, these results will also hold for smaller stakes, too. That's a good question, though. Yes? I have to ask this Chicago person, who earns more? The people who choose to compete earn more. Because when you think about it, you're earning three times as much. So if everyone chooses to compete, they're taking more money from us. And if, if you have a 33% chance, I, I'll get to whether men or women earn more. If you have a 33% chance to win or higher, you should always compete. So now guess who earned more? The men in the blue and the women in the red. And it's because it's all based on who competes more. And it's, it's true because empirically, men and women do about the same in this task. But I'll tell you what, when we went back, you would not believe what we found when we went back to these villages. 
there were buckets and tennis balls lying all over the place. So, so that experiment was done at that point. Uh, there were expert ball throwers in. <laughs> but the reason why we did underhand is because the men did have an advantage on, on chucking spears amongst the Maasai for hunting. Okay? So now, but now this is very artificial in a sense, right? That's why we called it artifactual. So can we take that type of reasoning and do something more in the field? Because what's the big argument against an artifactual field experiment? It's that the nature of the task and the incentives, et cetera, are artificial. And it's not necessarily the population like the official from the White House argued, but it's actually the properties of the situation. They're so foreign in a lab experiment or an artifactual field experiment that it's leading to curious results. So when Glenn and I wrote this paper, we said, okay, the next step in a field experiment lineage would be what we call the framed field experiment. And that's, let's have them do the exact same task that they always do in their course of life. Except here, people still know that they're taking part in an experiment, in a frame field experiment. So guess what people argue, what's bad about frame field experiments? When you're being watched, you might act differently. Heisenberg uncertainty principle, some people loosely call that the Hawthorne effect, Pygmalion effect in psychology literature. So it's possible that the act of observation affects that which is observed. And that's what leads to what we call the natural field experiment, which is when I had all of you raise your hands, I asked you, have you, have you uh, taken an Uber ride in the past six months anywhere in the world? If you have, you've been part of one of my experiments probably. Natural field experiment is you do exactly what you're supposed to be doing, except you're part of an experiment. You haven't signed any consent forms for me, but you've opted into this market. Okay, so let's talk a little bit about, can we use a natural field experiment to understand the gender pay gap? That's where I wanna go now. Okay, so our first one, which was published a few years ago, is we set up a firm to hire people to do administrative office positions. Okay, so we advertise across 20 cities in the US on Craigslist, we advertise different cities, uh, different, pardon me, wage schemes and jobs. And here today, I'll just talk about the two different wage schemes, kind of the, the preferences of the day is one job has a fixed wage, $15 per hour. And we look at how many people apply to that versus a scheme that pays you $12 per hour put in a, a $6 bonus per hour if you outperform a fellow worker. Okay, so that's a way to operationalize the piece rate versus a competitive scheme. And then we'll simply look at people who have applied to those jobs and we'll look at whether men and women act the same way they do in the lab and the same way they do in artifactual field experiments. Okay, so that will be natural field experiment one. Natural field experiment number two will be about negotiation. Same kind of setting. Advertise identical jobs, except for one job, we say wages are negotiable. For the other job, which is identical, we leave that sentence out. And that's it. Okay, so that's a very simple, very large natural field experiment where identical job, including that sentence and taking it out. And that's what I mean by leaving it vague, it's just, it's not in there, okay? So let's see what happens. In the first field experiment, what actually happens is, is that both men and women shy away from the competitive scheme. Where before, remember what the lab in the artifactual field experiment told us is that only women shy away from competition. In the field, they both do, but you get the result because women shy away from it more than men do. And they shy away from it enough to where those early search differences can lead 
to significant 5 to 10 percent wage differences across men and women. It's just because of the early search differences. Yes? Yeah. It's pretty much across every occupation, okay. including, it, including occupations where women dominate. Yeah. That's a good question, though, is that can we learn about the composition of it? Um, now, I'm not going to argue that it's the same magnitude, but it's the same sign. Okay? Okay? Now, the second natural field experiment here, what we find here is something really interesting. When we tell women that wages are negotiable, they bargain like mad, and they actually bargain more than men do. So when women are told it's OK to negotiate, they do. And in fact, they negotiate more than men. But when that sentence is left out, Women negotiate much less. And in fact, the men who negotiate are the lowest quality men. So you not only have this issue about men negotiate a lot more than women in ambiguous situations. Because in an ambiguous situation, you're not sure what's appropriate. When you're not sure what's appropriate, men go for it. And they go for it hard. And it's the lowest quality men who go for it the most. And women shy away from negotiating salary when it's ambiguous or when they're not sure. But when they're told it's OK, they bargain like mad. That's a simple concept now. Just the way we put together our job adv advertisements affects who applies and the wage where you start the job at. Small change, one sentence in the labor announcement, in the advertisement, people picked up on that cue. And men and women pick on, up on it very differently. That's, again, consistent with this notion that we're looking for social cues. And in developed countries, the socialization and the social cues tell men to act one way and women to act another way manifests itself in these data as well. Thousands and thousands of applications into these jobs. So I'm not talking about a small sample size here. I'm going to close the gender pay gap here and ask if you have any questions before I move on to discrimination. Yes? Can you actually advertise for jobs that don't exist? Mm -mm. These are all real jobs. We hire people and they work for me. I don't deceive anyone. Uh, administrative office positions, exactly what the advertisement was for. Yeah, as a chairman, I have a lot of work to do. <laughs> I also do, I'm also the chief economist of Uber on the side, so I have extra work. Um, but you know, these are all legitimate positions. Every field experiment that I run, there's no deception. In economics, there's this unwritten rule that we cannot deceive our subjects. That's, that's, a, that's a, a difference between what economists do and what psychologists do. We can talk about whether that's good or bad. It's, I'm just making a positive statement that none of, all of these have IRB approval, and none of them have deception. Yes? A missing step in all of this is basically made an assumption that the competitive, competitiveness trait is more productive that we want people to be. I think society has made that by making the winner take all type of society the way that we've set up our pyramids and firms. But if you want to talk about productivity, I think many of these incentives can be counterproductive. There can be, I've done a lot of work on sabotage, for example. When you have a more convex pay scheme and performance, the more convex it is, the more sabotage you will have between workers. So if you look at total factor productivity, it can be a very negative effect by putting people in a competitive setting. You're right that we're assuming here that the marginal product is what I'm doing though is I'm taking what the lab has done and look, let's set it up as two different incentive schemes and see what people prefer. What you wanted to go to is 
if I'm interested in efficiency and productivity, uh, society has told us that it's very convex. And I'm taking that as the rule when I set up my incentive schemes. Different interpretation, I agree. I agree. Yeah. I mean, I'm not saying I believe that's true. No, I, I think, look, if you believe our results on sabotage, so we have two or three experiments now on sabotage and natural field experiments, I can set up an environment where the more competitive it is, and I'm, I'm defining competition by variance, so very convex incentive scheme when, when I'm having people compete, I can get people to screw each other over in a maddening way that makes a productivity close to zero or negative. So no doubt that there are settings like that. And are there settings like that in the real world? Some people might argue yes. But that's an incentive scheme problem, I think, first and foremost. It's, we just haven't set up the incentives right. What I'm trying to get at here is, first, are there preference differences for incentive schemes? And if there are, is it because of sex differences or because of gender differences? And the path that I'm going down is that gender differences are very important. They're clearly complementary. It's sex and gender. But I think these, these data suggest that gender is really super important. Suggests. I'm, I'm, I hope I'm very careful with, I'm not proving anything causally because it's outside my, my randomization here. But still a reduced form result that way. Yes? I wonder if you could replace the word competitive with confident. Yeah, we actually don't use competitive in the experimental um, protocol. I use it here just to give you the flavor of what those are. But that said, loaded words affect behavior. Uh, so your point is exactly right. In the uh, schemes themselves, we just describe the incentive scheme and don't call it piece rate or competitive. We, we, we don't mess around with loaded terms. We just say, for every successful try you have under scheme one, you earn 50 cents. If you choose scheme two, you earn $1.50 if you make more balls than the person next door. And then we switch what A and B is across people. Yeah. OK, y y your point is, John, if you could actually set up an experiment where you got beliefs. So the second time we went back, we actually got their beliefs and rewarded them based on how accurate their beliefs were. And in these settings, women are more overconfident than men in the Cassie society, which is very similar but opposite of what men, overconfident young men, in uh, the developed world. So it's overconfident young women. Now, that's still like a reduced form thing of what, why is that? And my argument is it's because societal influences. Yeah. Go ahead. What are the multiple agencies you're able to control out at all, whether the men negotiate or exactly because they're outside options? What's the difference? Yeah, remember, I'm looking at. Here I have good randomization because I have the exact same man, I have John, getting an ad. And then I have John, too, getting the ad that says wages are negotiable. So I, ha I have the outside opportunities controlled for because I have randomization here. I'm randomizing at the city level, so the, the orthogonality assumption by, de by, by my assumption of that the randomization worked, I'm fine with that. So remember, I'm comparing a men across these two settings and women across these two settings. OK, does that make sense? OK. Yes, go ahead. People are choosing to apply for the job based on seeing what they do. What we do in all these experiments, I left this on the sidelines, is we announce the job, and then they send in, I am interested in this job. Then we give them the way. Yeah, that, that's how we deal with the endogeneity. Otherwise, we're, we're, we're in big trouble because we don't know the denominator. 
Yeah, so that's how we make sure we're controlling for the denominator. That's, that's a good point. OK, does that make sense? You have to do it in the second stage. See that? You express interest, and then we randomize you. Yeah, that's good. OK, good. Let's move on to discrimination. You guys teach discrimination here, right? Models of discrimination. Can I ask some of the students? What are the two major models of, that economists have for discrimination? I'll give you a hint. One was Becker's original uh, thesis in 1957 that he wrote at the University of Chicago. What was that theory? Taste-based discrimination, right? People will, a firm or a person will forego profits to cater their prejudice. I will hurt someone else because it makes me feel good. Taste-based discrimination. What's the other major theory that we have? Statistical or what Pagu called third degree price discrimination. Here, I don't really care. I don't get utility out of hurting people. But if I can make more money, I will discriminate. That's a really hard problem to tackle with mounds and mounds of data. You have mounds and mounds of data. What you can observe is that discrimination exists. We've done that for years as economists. But can we beat up mounds and mounds of data to figure out the underlying motivation or which of these two models is right? No. Nearly impossible. I think LeBand and Piet is the closest, and they don't even do a very good job of it. And it's in a major journal. Why is it important? Why? Because we develop policies based on what kind of discrimination is occurring. Think about quotas. If you're a football fan, think about the Rooney Rule. All of those are under the model of taste-based discrimination without even knowing that that's at work. Okay. Back in 2004, I put together a, a theory and a set of field experiments that allowed me to parse what kind of discrimination was at work in the markets that I was looking at back in the early 2000s. Now we've, we've come back to that research and I want to tell you a little bit about it and show you the power of a natural field experiment, how I can just use two simple experimental cells to show you what kind of discrimination is happening in markets. Okay, so here's the new experiment. I have 12 disabled, these are people in wheelchairs, and 12 non-disabled people take the exact same cars out to different Chicago body shops. And what each car has is a defect that we want fixed. OK, so what I mean by this is the disabled person takes a car out to, uh, I think in this first experiment, six different shops. And then a non-disabled person takes the same car out to six other shops. And then I have 12 and 12 go across all kinds of different shops asking for a price quote. This isn't. You have not only a fender bender, but you need a new engine. I'm not in that world about uploading, which we talked a little bit about the mechanic. We know that, that world from Henry. Um, this world is there's just something that needs to be fixed. OK? So I have the exact same cars going out. They're reading the exact same script. So it's a natural field experiment from the mechanic's viewpoint. What you find in, those first, in this first experiment is that the disabled receive prices that are about 30% higher than the non-disabled receive. Okay. So now we see there's discrimination in this market, but what is the nature of discrimination? Why are the disabled getting discriminated against? It could be that mechanics just don't like the disabled. Probably not, but it could be. Or it could be that there are search differences. I know it's harder for the disabled to go and get multiple quotes, so I'm going to give them a higher price. That's third degree price discrimination. Just looking at data like this, impossible to tell. 
Okay, so what we did is we give a survey to the disabled, and what we find is that they do search less. We then ask body shop mechanics, who do you think searches more? They believe that the disabled search less. So this is at least some evidence consistent with third degree price discrimination. So we then have an idea, let's first of all go out and try to replicate that result, send new pairs out, new cars out, but then let's run a new treatment whereby we have all the agents say, I'm getting a few price quotes today. We have the disabled and the non-disabled say, I'm getting a few price quotes today. Okay, so that's, these are our two cells now. I'm trying to replicate and then I'm adding a treatment. So here's what happens when you replicate. Now it's a 20% difference, but you still observe discrimination against the disabled. So people who are in a wheelchair receive on average $600 price quote. The non-disabled receive on average a $500 price quote for the exact same fix. Okay, but now the next click is gonna tell us what model is at work. And what this suggests is after the disabled give the signal, I'm getting a few price quotes today, guess what happens? Now their quotes are isomorphic to the non-disabled. Once you've sent the signal that the search will be equal, the discrimination goes away. Should, should Gary's, would Gary's theory predict this, Gary Becker? No. Either you like disabled or you don't. It doesn't really much matter if they say an extra sentence. You always should discriminate against that group. This is reasonably strong evidence, I would say, that it's third degree price discrimination. We could do this across many different markets. Once we have the model in mind and we have randomization, we can set up where the two theories should be at odds with each other. Simple experiment, I believe powerful to tell us what is the underlying motivation of these mechanics. I'll stop there and ask if you have any questions about, about that natural field experiment. Go ahead. There must be other groups that mechanics think are going to research high, but also high prices for that. Absolutely. So I would say that I could replicate this by, in fact, we've done it with um, across race with buying cars, and we've done it across sexual orientation in buying cars. Sexual orientation, it's straight out Becker discrimination, taste-based discrimination. And what ends up happening is the over all these data sets, what it feels like is that when it's a choice, it tends to be taste-based discrimination. When it's not a choice, it tends to be third-degree price discrimination, what you observe, which is, which is sort of an interesting result. At least, so in general, when people say it's, it's uh, X, obesity, then I say, well, if there's any discrimination, it's going to likely be consistent with that model. Yes? When they, when they say in these experiments that they are going to get a few quotes today, is there an action associated with that as well? They actually... Oh yeah, they, now let's go back to this, is that all of these cars are fixed. They're not fixed by all the mechanics, of course. What we did is we did exactly what a consumer would do. We took the lowest prices and went back to those mechanics and they fixed it. Our guys also got a few price quotes today. Absolutely. I'm just wondering, why there is, what will you make of the fact that the non-disabled? That means that these mechanics had the belief that they were going to get a few price quotes without even having them say it. Why? Because that's very similar to that. That's what that says to me. Does that make sense? It just seems surprising to me that just by saying it, and I'm just wondering if they were doing more than just saying it, but they like leaving the shop to actually get those price quotes for something. Oh, yeah, so we have a monitor over there. They go in, get the price quote, come back out and drive away, and then the monitor gets the information and the survey from them. And then when we go back, the nice thing is they could just be making it up because we don't have them mic'd or anything. But when we go back and say, we got this price quote for that, 
every time it was honored. So I think that our price quotes are right. Now, what, what they're saying, we also tell them stick with the script, but I can't promise you that they stuck with the script in these, absolutely. But I can say when I told them to say a few price quotes, this went down a lot by 20% and this stayed the same. Yeah. Yes, go ahead. I'll lose a business. I'll lose a business. Not, not that I'm going to be viewed as a bigot or I'm just afraid that I'm going to lose a business. Yeah, so Becker, discrimination does not have in there a parameter that says if other people view me as a bigot, I'm going to have less of a taste. It's not in that model. But you can always create a new model, absolutely, that would make it indistinguishable from third degree. And, and one thing is to say I have a preference for what somebody else thinks. Now, now it's, there's not a unique prediction in Gary's theory versus Pagu or, or Arrow. Yeah, yes? Um, were the disabled and non Yes. Yeah. Any other questions on that? Okay, very good. Very good. Let's, uh, now I'm just going to go through a, a few slides. One slide on why people give to charity. What do you think the major reason why people think others are giving to charity is? If you go all the way back to Socrates and Plato, what do, you, what do they say? The reasons why people give to charitable causes. What was that? Altruism. Altruism, right? Altruism is I care about the well being of another person. Altruistic. What we found in most of our data is at least small givers give purely for selfish reasons, not altruism. What is it? It's the warm glow of making yourself feel good. And what Jim Andrioni co uh, coined is a, the, his warm glow theory. Gary Becker actually had that in a 1964 footnote of one of his papers. I think Gary was one of the early behavioral economists, actually, um, where he coined that people have this warm glow. So there, you don't really care about whether it's helping someone. You just want the warm glow feeling that you've done something nice, a purely selfish viewpoint. Now, once you have that in mind, we've worked with charitable organizations around the world to say if altruism isn't the underlying model for most people and selfishness is, it's a very different kind of ask to try to raise more money. Now, people usually say to me, well, John, that's a real bummer of a result. You're saying people aren't altruistic. What I say is, what do I care why people give to the charitable cause? I just care that they've given, and then that can help a poor child or a, a, a cleft palate being fixed if you're smile train or an extra wish from Make-A-Wish Foundation. That's what I care about, are helping needy people. I don't really much care where your, where your utility is coming from if you're a giver, but why do I care about why they give? Because then the organizations can raise more money. That's why I care. Externalities. Even though Donald Trump will not admit that this is an externality, what's the biggest externality that most scientists, especially environmental scientists, will say humanity faces? Global warming, climate change. Now, as you look at it, households are a major contributor to climate forcing. So you can think about what are the best ways to induce households to adopt green technologies. The one thing that humans have in common is that we tend to underperform on tasks where it's costly now and the benefits are in the future. So think about dropping out. Canada has a dropout problem just like the US does, dropping out of high school. Education is a cost right now benefits in the future. What do we have? We have underinvestment. Going to a, the doctor and getting a health checkup. Cost now, 
Benefits in the future, fewer people go to the doctor. Taking in technologies like CFLs or green technologies in your home. Costs now, benefits in the future, guess what? Nobody adopts. That's just a fundamental problem of how humans look at streams of benefits versus a cost up front. So we've set up a series of large scale field experiments trying to get households to adopt green technologies. And what we found is that norms and prices serve as really interesting complements. So here's what I mean by that. If I go to a household and say 70% of your neighbors have this green technology, why don't you have it too? That's very effective to get people to adopt for the first time. But if I keep going back to that over and over again, guess what happens? I get a zero effect very fast. So at that point, on the margin of two, three, four, five, or six adoptions, prices work really well. So in that way, you have a pecuniary incentive complementing the non-pecuniary incentive, and together, they form an optimal policy of maximizing adoptions at a minimal cost. It's to use these two congruently. And one works on the extensive margin, one works on the intensive margin, which is sort of an interesting result on adoption of technologies. So let me wrap up here. I've done, more or less, I've talked about everything up here except for a frame field experiment. Now, I think it's clear that sampling from each one of those, we can more deeply understand the economic science. I think that's no doubt. In the past, we focused on empirical models. We've had ideas, we've gone back to our office, we've downloaded mounds and mounds of data, and we beat it up and we overlay an empirical model on it. That's still the dominant way to do things. We all know that. Everyone I talk to Sans Henry is doing that as, as an empirical exercise, which is fine, great. But my argument is that the lab, we've been doing that for a while as well, between is sufficiently or considerably undersampled. And these serve as a complement to lab and empirical models. And I talk about that in this Journal of Economic Perspectives paper that I published in, in 2011. Now, I want to end with thinking about, well, how far has economics advanced in the past 20 years? So I dug out one of my very first referee reports. And this was 1994. This was my first field experiment that I did as a grad student. It was in a sports card market where people buy, sell, and trade these sports cards, pictures of athletes, baseball players, football players, basketball players, sent it in to a journal. And the referee says, this author clearly does not understand experimental economics, which is best done in the lab. I strongly advise rejecting this, quote, field experimental, unquote, paper. That, that's said to a, a third year PhD student. That's, uh, that's what I got back. And at the time, at Wyoming, everyone's telling me, just do things in the lab. No reason to go out in the field, no value. Let's fast forward. A recent referee report. Here's what the referee, same journal actually. I, I can't promise the same referee, but same journal. This author performs a field experiment, which clearly is a preferred approach to answer questions within economics. Pretty good. But I still advise rejecting the paper. <laughs> so I, we've made a little bit of headway, but still probably worked. Uh, work to do at least on my end. So I'm going to end there and if you have any questions I'll, I'll gladly entertain those questions. Thank you very much. And quickly before questions I really want to thank um, sponsors. Thank you very much. Um, colleagues, everyone has been wonderful. Uh, Chris, wonderful host. I really appreciate it. And, uh, I've talked to a few students as well, which has been very rewarding. So I want to thank everyone for um, the, the great hospitality so far. Okay, and I'll, I'll throw it out now if you have any questions about any of this or, or actually anything in field experiments, I'll be glad to, to try to take on for you, okay?
I'll throw it out to you. Go ahead. How do you get Google or Uber to yeah. work with you? It's a great question. At the beginning, what I did was I used my own assets to run field experiments. So what was that? When I was little, I was a huge sports card collector. And I would shovel snow and be paid $5. And I would run to the grocery store and buy baseball cards. In the summers, I would cut grass, get $7, run to the grocery store, buy baseball cards. So I have all these cards. And I was going out with my girlfriend at the time. And I became my wife. We would go to these sports card shows and buy, sell, and trade. And then I had this huge collection. And at those sports card shows, at the same time, I was learning about economics as an undergrad at Stevens Point. And I thought, I wonder if there's a way that I can combine this business with the business of learning about economics and actually run experiments. Because A, nobody else in the world will let me. There wasn't a Google and an Uber back then, but they wouldn't let me anyway. Nobody would listen to me. So I had to do things on my own terms. I had to go to these markets. That's why my first probably 20 field experimental papers were in the sports card market. And people would say to me, well, the sports card market's not that important. And I would say, I agree it's not. But it's the only way I can run field experiments. <laughs> There's no other way. So now as you advance, people start to come to you and, and ask you to do research. At Uber now, it's easier because I'm the, as a chief economist, I can run my own field experiments. But I still realize that doesn't help you that much. So what I've started is what's called the Summer Institute for Field Experiments, where I bring in every summer 20 firms to the University of Chicago. And I bring in roughly 40 to 60 academics, students, young professors, who team up with those firms. And these are firms who want to do field experiments. And then we have a week-long institute on how to run field experiments, how the firm should be interacting with the academic. And we more or less come up with several questions that the group should then go out and run after the institute is done. We've done this for two years. So my, my first inkling is to tell you, apply for the summer institute. It's being announced right now. Hopefully you're chosen, and then you have a set of firms that you'll run field experiments with. Um, I think that cold calling in that doesn't work that well. I think using all the connections you can to people who know somebody high up to get you in a conversation does help. That's how I got in with a lot of firms, and that's how my postdocs do as well. But I would say the Summer Institute for Field Experiments is one way. Other than that, I would try to use all connections and, and also work with government. I've been doing work with the US Behavioral Insights Team, the UK Behavioral Insights Team, and the Aussie Behavioral Insights Team, which have been, they've been more open to, uh, to that. Yeah. Now, Uber, I, I've put out a call for people who have ideas to do field experiments at Uber that you should um, email. It's called ubernomics at uber.com. And you should email your ideas there. And then we vet those ideas. And then we have several academic partners that we run field experiments with at Uber. So those are, those are some ways in which, let me continue on that. This summer, we'll be announcing something that's similar to the science, the science of Philanthropy Initiative, which is something that I ran for three years whereby I teamed people up with charitable organizations. And a lot of academics were partnering then with 501c3s to run charity field experiments. We're doing that same thing now with education and setting up what's, what I call districts of innovation, where I'm going to have seven teams from around the country, around the world, if we get enough applications, doing field experiments within an educational district. We do the same thing with the World Bank on environmental issues, where I have seven teams at the World Bank doing uh, randomization of, in some cases, really large scale 
uh, infrastructure investment in a random way, electrification, for example. So those are kind of like four or five ways for, for people to get involved. I hope that helps answer the question. Good. Because I think that's the biggest barrier to entry. What I started right away was I started doing a lot of special issues. So I, I edited all these special issues and field experiments, but then I realized it wasn't an outlet problem. It was an input problem, that people who wanted to get started doing field experiments, the barriers to entry were so high. And that, that's one of the beauties of a lab experiment is that the barriers to entry are pretty low because it's uh, very cost effective to get a, a subject pool in a lab experiment versus flying to Tanzania or, or the Cassies or whatever. Yeah. Or getting a hundred vans fixed for, for people who have dents in the front fender. Any other questions? Awesome, thanks. So, um, just to finish off here, I guess I have a couple of things like to say. Uh, one is, um, one is that uh, there's a reception after this at the University Club, and uh, everybody's welcome to that. Um, and uh, also, we have a gift, uh, which has come from um, Alison Morgan, who's here, and she is uh, actually um, Macintosh's daughter. So, uh, <laughs> the autobiography, there we go. Thank you very much. You. Okay, and let me just finish by saying thank you very much, John, for a fantastic uh, talk. Cheers.